two minutes after the hour, I'll get started. Um, so my name is Amy Cruz. I'm a partner here at Prime Movers Lab. Um, so grateful to those of you who are with us today, our limited partners, our founders, our extended Prime Movers family, our new growth fund LPs. Um, really, really excited to be here. For those of you that don't know us, Prime Movers Lab is a venture firm. Uh, we, do, we invest in breakthrough science uh, for the potential to impact billions of lives and deep tech. And this psychedelics webinar is certainly one of those topics that has the uh, potential to, to impact those that many lives. Um, you know, part of our work here at Prime Movers Lab is not just to educate ourselves for, for doing deals and educate our LPs, but actually to share um, some thoughts and thought leadership around this space. We have technical partners and other advisors that we work with. And so we really see it as part of our charter to not just, you know, ser service our own, our own deals, but really, uh, you know, advance the science and technology that we're so passionate about. Um, just for some housekeeping, um, we're going to keep this whole webinar to one hour. Uh, we're going to save questions. Uh, for the end, but please type them in uh, to the Q&A or the chat, whichever is, is sort of easiest for you. Um, I'm delighted uh, to have um, three, uh, three participants today that I've gotten to know a little bit and, and really have some great conversations. And just to tell you a little bit about the motivation behind psychedelics, for those of you that haven't read, I've written a couple blog posts over the last couple weeks around why we're so excited about this space. It really has a transformative potential in mental health. And so want to turn this over to our panelists. So today we have uh, Cosmo Fielding, Jonathan Sporn, and uh, Rob Berman. And, and I'm going to uh, let them lead off with essentially a little bit about why they uh, got into this space and, and maybe through that do their own introduction. So Cosmo, I'd love to start off with you. Great. Thanks, Amy. Um, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so, so I'm, I'm Cosmo. I am uh, the, the CEO of a company called Beckley SciTech. But I suppose the, the the background of that story and and my own background is that um, my family have really been involved in kind of pioneering and promoting psychedelic research and science for for several decades. Um, my mother, who's called Amanda Fielding, set up and she's a co-founder of Beckley SciTech, set up um, a, a foundation called the Beckley Foundation um, in 1998 um, when when this subject was not at all fashionable um, and with, with with the aim of uh, trying to shed scientific light on these substances that she was very firmly in belief that they had great medical potential and, and were being kind of ignored by science due to kind of unwarranted prejudice and so basically spent the last two decades um, I guess becoming a, the Beckley Foundation became a bit of a center of gravity for the researchers uh, who were interested in this space and built up a, a huge amount of kind of uh, well a huge head of steam and was was involved in in many of the kind of I guess most pioneering and groundbreaking uh, research that's happened over the last couple of decades like the first ever brain imaging study in LSD and psilocybin which showed the the down regulation of the default mode network and that led on to um, uh, uh, the first clinical trial in, in with psilocybin and treatment resistant depression that, that showed amazing results um, where over 60% of the patients were depression free after one week having suffered from untreatable depression for 18 years before that. Anyway, and so so I best, I, long story short, I, I've been involved in this for a very, very long time. I've, I've kind of grown up with it. And um, about five years ago, we, we started working on for-profit companies that could increase the scale and ambition of, of what we are trying to do, but be completely aligned with the, the nonprofit foundation and, and find ways to support the, the nonprofit work that we do as well. Thank you, Cosmo. That was a great, great overview as well of some of the work. Jonathan, go ahead. Uh, hi, and I, thanks, Amy. I'm Jonathan Sporn, and I'm a psychiatrist, and I uh, have um, gone uh, sort of in my career arc from uh, practicing psychiatry in Boston and um, really understanding the patient population and the limitations of these drugs that we, you know, have had as our sort of standard of care now for many decades, you know, it's like the SSRIs and, and such. Um, and, um, and I moved then to do research training at Mass General Hospital in Boston and, and then on to the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland, and um, helped set up the mood and anxiety program there with Dennis Charney and Sandy Manji and, um, and uh, ran multiple uh, studies at the NIH and in this, this sort of uh, area. And I always had a particular interest in um, the uh, 
importance of uh, glutamate and um, excitatory and inhi inhibitory uh, balances in terms of understanding antidepressant activity. And um, and so so that was some of the stuff we, we did at uh, NIH. And then after I left to go to Johnson & Johnson, that kind of culminated in uh, my colleagues there um, following up on work that Rob Berman had done at Yale on ketamine and, and such. So uh, it was a very exciting time. I, I, I loved being at the NIH. And then I moved to Johnson & Johnson and um, uh, uh, worked in both neurology and psychiatry and then to Pfizer, uh, where I uh, did a whole bunch of different things. and. Um, uh, and finally, uh, I, I uh, departed to start a, a, a kind of psychedelic related company called uh, Perception Neuroscience after Aldous Huxley's The Doors of Perception. And, um, and that, that company is developing in the R stereo isomer of ketamine, and it's in kind of the phase two stage now and coming along nicely. So I'm very happy with that. Um, um, and I worked as the CSO there, but I I had, we really had a bigger vision, um, and, you know, and, and I felt like other people could take care of that. So I, I left, and uh, my colleagues uh, at Columbia, and now with Rob Berman, are, we're developing um, uh, at Gilgamesh Pharmaceuticals a, a suite of, of uh, 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 psychedelic-related drugs that are, uh, you know, using kind of a lot of cutting-edge science and and pharma-savvy pharma people. That's awesome. How about you, Rob? Hey, Amy. Um, thanks. So, uh, you know, how do I get here? I think it, it really stems from a real scientific kind of uh, start, as well as entrepreneurial. So, you know, going back to the 90s, uh, I was a, a psychiatrist uh, uh, doing research at Yale. And uh, really, my interest was in exploiting the serotonin system uh, for the treatment of depression, and looking at different serotonin receptors. Now, of course, at that point, uh, the 5-HT2A receptor was off limits. As, I mean, an agonist certainly was. And, um, and really no one had thought about exploiting that. Um, but I did a lot of studies looking at serotonin. Uh, but as Jonathan alluded to, I also studied glutamate and I was the first to publish on the role of ketamine in uh, the treatment of depression. And, um, uh, you know, Yale, is, I mean, it was, it was great findings. Yale is not a uh, New Haven is not an ideal place to get a lot of clinical trials done. And I became <laughs> sure. more of a clinical trial, this small town. And, um, and then went to Pfizer and then Bristol Myers Squibb, you know, a lot focused on other uh, serotonin plays. Uh, and then um, I left um, Bristol Myers Squibb and started Biohaven uh, Pharmaceuticals, uh, which has a migraine drug and also had a, a, a drug that was a glutamate acting agent too. Um, and we're interested in depression uh, and other things, uh, but uh, and that that became very successful on the New York Stock Exchange. And uh, but I step back; uh, it's more of in a commercial phase, and my interest is really more in this uh, kind of uh, incipient stage of companies that have a potential for high impact. And so, you know, I, I've known Jonathan through the years and happened uh, back into him, and so we. You know, I joined him up at Gilgamesh, and I really see this as the coming of a full circle in the sense, you know, here's another serotonin receptor, the, the you know, the psilocybin receptor or the 2A receptor that I think we can exploit. And there's more to be done. It's the last frontier in serotonin. Yeah. And, uh, and I think the glutamate story has not played out uh, fully. I mean, we can make a better ketamine. Uh, and, uh, and so that's why I'm here. It's exciting. Uh, I think there's a lot more that's going to play out over the next few years in this space. Excellent. Well, thank you, and and you know, I hope I hope the folks on the line, you know, are are all, you know, bewildered as I am at the at the you know sort of depth of experience that we have here on the webinar. And and with that, I'd actually like to ask a question about sort of like the why now. Like this is an exciting and vibrant space. You know, you'd have to be hiding under a rock to to not see you know all the things that are being posted about about psychedelics now. Like what what happened? What was the transition point when this uh, you know, all of a sudden became acceptable acceptable again for doing clinical trials and other work. I'm, I'm curious, maybe Cosmo, if you want to, because of your long history in this space, maybe you've seen a transformation that you could help explain explain to us. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, it's a funny question for me to ask why now, because I suppose 
it's been always since <laughs> right. I, why not it's, right it's yeah yeah been, uh the the thing that my, my family have been kind of devoted to uh, ever since I was born so but but you know obviously kind of what what's what what's interesting to watch indeed for for my mother is that she's gone from being this kind of eccentric outsider to someone who's heralded as a kind of global thought leader and pioneer now and 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 is kind of world famous for it and 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 basically I think really what you know a number of researchers have done over over the last couple of decades is do really, really good science that you can't really argue against. And it, it, the, the one thing that's the, the, the kind of most powerful tool of breaking down taboos and prejudice, I think is, is kind of really good science. And, and, you know, as that snowballed with Imperial, with Johns Hopkins, with NYU, and, you know, really top researchers and top research institutes having these kind of, you know, really breakthrough results where, you know, as, as I mentioned, you know, you're seeing patients with 18 years of depression, untreatable depression, suddenly after one dose of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, having, you know, it being 60% of them being in remission after that single dose, three months later, still over 40% are in remission. And, and so, so it is, you know, psychedelics from a kind of pharmaceutical perspective represent a completely new class of, of neuropsychiatric medicine and and that is obviously an area with huge unmet need and there's a you know in parallel a growing awareness in the world about the need for for kind of better mental health treatments and and then i suppose you know obviously the media's caught on to it in in the last few years and then indeed um wall street and and you know and and the regulators and so it's just kind of snowballed i guess hasn't it yeah yeah, yeah I, I just add i think that you know that look the it, it, there are, you know, particular points here, like, you know, Roland Griffiths at uh, Hopkins, who, you know, is sort of a well-respected, you know, very high-end researcher, you know, uh, actually staking his reputation on something that is, you know, in some ways has been really stigmatized um, and outlawed, <laughs> literally, uh, you know, has been, you know, those sorts of things. And you have other people, you know, not you know, uh, uh, Cosmos family and uh, Rick Doblin, you know, who, uh, you know, you can go back and see discussions, you know, in nature from, you know, 2004 or something. Right. Of, you know, yeah. it, so this is, you know, there have been these people that have been really focused on making sure that this, you know, happens. I, I think also the, I just, I, this is just, I don't have any evidence of this, but I almost get the feeling like the government, like the FDA became very open to this in part because there was some institutional guilt that, that the, you know, the government had basically <laughs> fucked this all up, you know, <laughs> and, and, and that they, they felt some, you know, even though they were a little bit, you know, it was a little weird having these F FDA people, you know, some of them are in the public health service with uniforms, you know, getting up showing psychedelic slides. It was, right. a little, but, but I, I think the other, the other one just comment is just that I think that this, you know, there were so many thousands of people who have had exposure to psychedelics. And these are very profound, emotional, spiritual, insightful, et cetera, experiences. And it's really hard to erase that. Um, you know, uh, uh, you can push it down, but it's hard to erase that. And I think yeah. what I would say, just, you know, coming at it from a psychiatrist point of view, is, you know, my job used to be when I was in Boston would be people would just send me all these people who they couldn't get better. And some of it was that they just wanted to cover their ass because they didn't get sued. Uh, but, you know, and so it would be like, what do I do with this person? Right. And it would be like, so I would just try anything, you know, because it would be like, I don't know, I, there's nothing, you know. So so I think that so there, was a, there were a lot of people, some of whom were influential and maybe people with resources, um, and you can, you know, you see this at Compass Pathways, for example, who were like personally affected right. themselves, their family, what have you, by the by conditions in which they saw with their own eyes that, that these things were set, were could could in the right hands be transformational. Right. And I think once that gets out, that uh, in a field where 
Jesus, you know, I mean, the last transformation, if you want it, was, you know, when I was a resident, when Prozac came on the market. Right. You know, that, 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 that was in the 80s. That was a long time ago. Yeah. A long time ago. So, yeah. so since the mid 80s, nothing. So yeah. I think that that kind, that kind of, you know, for people where the suffering is immense, the suicide rates are tremendous. I mean, right. this is an immense problem. So I think that's what's sort of pulling this is like people will go to the end of the earth, right. uh, you know, to fix some of these things. Right. These are big. Yeah. These are big overarching problems. You, you mentioned something and, and I know they're, you know, both Gilgamesh and others and, and Cosmo and, and Rob, maybe, you know, sort of open question here, like, you know, there, some people are looking at reducing the hallucinogenic or dissociative components of some of the, the molecules that are out there. What's, you know, what is, what are your hypotheses around um, the necessity for that sort of, you know, numinous experience versus it actually working on the nervous system and working on the receptors and having an efficacious effect just based on that alone? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take the, uh, the first crack at that. I mean, I think you have to break it down by which uh, molecules, which, which receptors you're looking at for the ketamine-like drugs, sure. the NMDA antagonists. There's very good data that you do not need the dissociative effect. And that's from drugs that work on a subtype selective uh, uh, part of the NMDA receptor from lenisamine, which is uh, a general NMDA antagonist. They're not associated with significant psychedelic effects in any way, but yet they still have profound antidepressant effects. Mm -hmm. So we know that for, for that kind of, for that kind of antidepressant agent, an NMDA antagonist, we don't need it. Now I'll open it to the others. I think the data for the 5-HT2A, the LSD psilocybin class is uh, less conclusive. It's still early days for that. Yeah, I, well, you know, I, I, I firstly, defer to, to Rob and Jonathan, who are obviously brilliant scientists, and uh, I am not a scientist by training, but I've obviously immersed myself in this subject. And, and you know, I, I think, obviously, what, going back to what Jonathan was saying is, you know, the thousands and thousands of people who have experimented with psychedelics, uh, it's, it's very hard to, to disconnect the subjective experience from, from the, the subsequent uh, you know, effects that, that come on after that. And, and so, you know, I think the peculiarities of looking at psychedelics from a drug development perspective, and this is, I suppose, comparable to, to cannabis in the sense that we're not starting from scratch. We're starting from uh, a, a real world evidence base of case reports, anecdotal reports and, and kind of observational data that you know, millions of people have, have tried these substances. And one can't, you know, and, and that is a major driver for why, you know, why there's a reason to believe that, that these drugs are going to be successful in, in, um, in clinical development. And, and you know, it's, it's really up to a point, it's about proving what we already know in a clinical setting. And, and, and what we know is that the psychedelic effect when combined with therapy seems to be very effective. And there is in, in, in the clinical research that's been done by Johns Hopkins and various others, you know, that there is a, a direct correlation between the intensity of, of, of what's called the, the mystical experience by Americans or ego dissolution experience by Europeans. Um, but the intensity of that experience in the subject directly correlates with the positive therapeutic outcome for the patient. So, so you know, in, in that sense, there, there is, you know, a, a strong link there. Um, but I, I, I think, as, as Rob says, I think there's definitely areas where I think one looks at um, potential applications where the psychoactive effect is potentially less important. And, 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 and so, you know, and, and particularly in kind of neurological areas as well, I think. And, and obviously, you know, again, if one looks at the real world data, data there is also the kind of whole microdosing movement, which is much less about strong psychedelic hallucinatory effects. So, so I, I think, I think, I think we will see that both routes will, will be fruitful essentially. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think that the, you know, you, 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 this question can, is a very fundamental one that everybody's asking. And you, you could see this also a little bit, you know, as like, you know, as light uh, a particle or a wave um, 
and uh, you know it's probably both, and or it is both, and um, and I I, I think that uh, I don't want to trivialize it, but at all because I do think it's a really important issue. But I I think if you think about it concretely, it's sort of like okay, so what exactly happens here? Let's imagine you take a large dose of LSD or psilocybin, and you have a you know tremendously insightful experience that. Uh, you know, you, 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 you would have had a lot of, tr you know, difficulty coming to those insights, you know, otherwise. So the question then becomes, now what happens? Because obviously the next day you go back to your life and right. in your life, you can now look and say, oh, well, gosh, you know, yesterday I, I you know, I loved everybody. Um, uh, but, um, that 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 the uh, that that full power of the effect um, is no longer there, right? So the question then and it becomes, what is left? And my my inkling about this is that what makes these drugs profound is that you get this profound experience, but it's not just the experience. That there is a longer term uh, neuroflexibility that um, uh, comes about that allows you to keep a piece of that and to process that differently than prior. And I think David, uh, was it not, or somebody said, you know, it's sort of, it's the big bang theory, you know, and, and you know, you have this big bang and then there's this uh, low level, you know, radiation that goes on forever everywhere in the universe, you know? Right. So, yeah. we, so you, it's, and, and I think that's what both of those pieces are. And so if, if that's the case, that both of these things are important. These right. re, what reset are important, and also you can maintain. You could use lower doses of these things in a pretty like a continuous way to maintain or enhance mental flexibility. Um, that's a separate issue. But so I think right. both of them, are, and and that'll be very important later as we figure out how the hell to use these things. Right. Exactly. Well, I've heard I've heard some clinicians talk about you know potentially maybe a bigger experience as a, as a reset experience. And then, you know, and then a maintenance dose or so. So I think, I think we're just at the edges of, of understanding how this is going to play out from a use perspective, but it's exciting to have the options. So given all of the efforts that are ongoing right now, clinical trials with the, I'll call them the original compounds, right. And then you have IP development around these sort of new molecules, how, you know, do we expect some of the original things to get rescheduled? Is it better, you know, to, to pursue the novel molecule route through the IP? Like, I'm, I'm curious how, how you guys think it's gonna, gonna shake out between the new and the old, um, you know, as a, as, a, as a starting point. Good question. <laughs> oh, that one's yours. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I, I actually can, can we, I, I just wanted to actually mention one thing that again, in case people listening aren't completely immersed in the subject, like everyone else who's, who's speaking, I think one thing that Jonathan was mentioning about that kind of big bang and, and the, the, the kind of big experience is, I think, I think a, a, another kind of peculiarity of this area of research is, is the main body of research and psychedelic research is not just giving the patients a drug, it's giving the patients in com a, a drug in combination with psychotherapy. And, and so the patients are given preparatory therapy to prepare them for the experience. Then there are therapists sitting there with the patient for the entire duration of that experience. And then they have integration therapy. So that that's kind of, again, a part of, as I, I think what Jonathan's saying as well is, is, you know, whether there'll be subsequent pharmacological interventions to help that change be maintained but there is also this kind of psychotherapeutic element thank you for it yeah cosmo that's super important thank you for thank you for leading with that yeah um uh, i i said so exactly right yeah and 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 basically so so in terms of old versus new i guess um so we we looked at that a lot so i i at beckley SciTech, I, I can i guess talk about what we decided to do um and I, I, I guess I'm lucky to be working with some very, very smart drug developers. Our, you know, our chief scientific officer was head of global commercial strategy at Johnson & Johnson. He, he oversaw his ketamine and, and we had the head of global medical affairs there as well, working for us now. And 
and and basically we we've the way we've seen it is what we call first second and third generation psychedelics and and so what we might what we mean by that is there's this kind of first wave of psychedelics that there's a, a huge well a large body of clinical data and safety data showing a range of potential applications in in uh, and clinical efficacy in a range of different diseases like addiction depression and various neurological diseases and, and so th those drugs are like psilocybin mdma lsd that have been studied for a long time and what we were looking at there is we we you know obviously compass pathways are, are the kind of uh, most famous company in, in the psilocybin space maps um are, are doing mdma for ptsd and um you know have, have a very very successful phase three study completed which showed really quite in very very powerful results and so we should i i am very confident that maps will be the first company with well, they're a non-profit, but they, they're a, a social benefit company who will get um, a, a psychedelic drug licensed in combination with psychotherapy for post-traumatic stress disorder. So, you know, there is definitely going, uh, well, not definitely, but I, I am very, very confident, and I'm sure the others on this call will, will, will agree that, you know, these, these, this first wave of drugs are going to get to market. I think the, the big, there are two major challenges for them, I would say, and, and one is the IP around them. These are obviously are, 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 are drugs that have existed for, for a very long time and, and a huge amount has been written about them. So, you know, proving genuine innovation and novelty in this area is, is not difficult. It is not easy in terms of kind of finding IP. So, you know, we as a company basically decided to look uh, um, uh, tried to see if we could find a, a kind of novel application for, for one of these drugs. And we identified this very, very rare um, headache condition called Sunha, which is a, a, a kind of, it's a, it's a very a kind of excruciatingly painful headache that people can get up to kind of 200 times a day. And it, it's an orphan disease, which means it's kind of so rare that it qualifies for special regulatory um, if, if you get orphan drug designation, you get additional kind of regulatory support from the FDA and the EMA and, and, and additional market protection. So we've filed a method of use patent in, in that area, looking at low doses of, of psilocybin. And we believe, you know, we can build IP. And in addition to that, what, what companies will be relying on is this data and marketing exclusivity that, that companies get given, which is basically, if you are the, the company that takes a drug through to licenses and, and commits the time and energy and money to create all the data package to prove it's a safe and effective drug, the regulators will give you uh, an exclusivity on that data, data package so that no one else can just come in and use your data and sell the drug for the same thing for a certain period. In, in, in the US, you get five, seven years protection. In, in Europe, you get eight to 10 years. And so with orphan diseases, the, the, these you, you get additional some additional years of market protection on top of the, the normal market protections as well. Right. So, so that's the first thing we were looking at. Then the, the second wave of, of medicines, again, is talking about old psychedelics, is what we talk about, what, what we mean by second generation is there is also a whole, like a, a large category of psychedelic drugs that have been used by thousands of people and often for hundreds or thousands of years, but are very under-researched from a scientific perspective. So they're not well characterized. There's very little clinical data. So this is a kind of, these are these kind of strange positions where we know what they do in humans based on all the real world evidence. Um, but the, the, there's basically no clinical data on them. So, so what we were looking at in, in this class of drugs is can we identify a drug that's a genuine, like offers a, a clear clinical advantage in differentiation over that first wave of drugs and, and where there's potentially more room to build IP because less is known about the drugs. Um, and so we, we landed on, on this drug called 5-MeO-DMT, which is basically a, a very short acting and potent psychedelic drug. It's, I mean, in kind of popular culture, it's known as the toad. It's, it's kind of naturally occurring in a toad venom. Mike Tyson got very excited about it, weirdly. Um, and, and, and basically, um, but, but, but the kind of the logic behind this, again, going back to this, this idea of mystical experience, what, what 5-MeO-DMT does is it induces, it, it, it's known to reliably induce a very powerful mystical experience in patients. 
and that's the, the that's the subjective experience that the the data that exists so far correlates with positive treatment outcomes sure and and so basically but 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 it does that in under an hour so the duration of action is under an hour whereas lsd psilocybin mdma the other major challenge for them is in a psychedelic assisted psychotherapy model they last for eight hours so you're requiring a therapist or even two therapists to sit with a patient for the entire duration of that experience so that's two patients the two therapists spending a whole day with a single patient so when you come to kind of rolling that out commercially that's a major kind of resource utilization limitation and, and a cost problem so if we could show comparable efficacy with 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 a 5 meo dmt but in do, do get the same efficacy in a treatment that lasts under an hour that would have a huge patient access advantage basically and and there are many other facets to it that mean that we believe we can build a kind of very robust ip around it in terms of the formulation the composition of matter etc right and then finally we are looking at the third generation which is new chemical entities which obviously right. has the strongest possible ip um and and obviously jonathan and, and robert are, are, are real experts in this so they can talk better about it. It's it's further away from market. So with psilocybin, we've got a clinical trial to start straight in patients. With with 5-MeO, we've done preclinical. We're going into phase one healthy volunteers now to prove it before going into patients. With, with new chemical entities, obviously you're starting at the drug discovery phase. Then you have to go into animals. Then then you go into humans and and, and, and you don't have the benefit of knowing what it does in humans already. Right. So, so it, that's that's the challenge but at the same time the advantages of of the ip are obviously very very attractive and if you have brilliant scientists like like rob and jonathan you can you can you can predict what's going to happen in advance right right well jonathan and rob would either of either of you like to quickly you know sort of respond to respond to that around the new new chemical entities element well, I'll, I'll add a few points and let John add onto that too. I mean, the, the advantage of the new chemical entities is you can really, there are things to improve upon. I mean, there are, uh, you know, uh, there there's a lot of anxiety for some patients who are given these agents and you can dial in a pharmacology to uh, limit that. And, um, and like we're trying to do at Gilgamesh also uh, control the pharmacology to try to, uh, you know, get these less than perceptual or mildly perceptual doses. So there's not a frank hallucination. And, and that would also have, you know, broad appeal. Imagine if people could take it home, you know, as, as Cosmo was saying, instead of having to be, um, you know, looked after by two highly trained therapists. And so, so there, there are things like yeah. that in this space. There's just a lot of, uh, there are unknowns and a lot of variables that uh, we still need to understand. And I think there's definitely opportunity for a new chemical entity, you know, to fulfill that, you know, with the right, yeah. you know, duration of effect and yeah, the there are, there are things to tweak in that space. It sounds like that that could make it yeah. um, both more efficacious or shorter acting or or yeah, or whatever. yeah. 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 No, it's, it's it's unclear that God put psilocybin in the mushrooms to treat the problem. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, that's that's an interesting question. We, we did have a question come on board and it was one of the questions that I had, like a lot of the focus is on antidepressants, but but we're seeing this used in a variety of different elements. Maybe Jonathan or, or, or Cosmo, do you want to speak to, you know, kind of the broad range of mental health issues that can be addressed here? Well, no, I, I, yeah, I just say, that, you know, quickly that, you know, um, first of all, there's a long history in psychiatry of drugs having relatively broad spectrum such that, you know, they get, for commercial reasons or historical reasons, they get referred to, say, as antidepressants, but, you know, they, they are effective at OCD, they're effective in anxiety disorders, et cetera. So, so I, I, I think that that's probably even more so with these compounds, because in essence, your you're, I think as Cosmo was sort of describing, you're creating this state of enhanced, you know, cognitive and behavioral flexibility um, that then allows people to, um, to make, uh, you know, changes in their uh, behavioral repertoire or their way of thinking um, that otherwise are difficult. So that can then apply to everything from, you know, anxiety, OCD, PTSD, um, depression, uh, eating disorders, uh, 
um, a whole host of things. And, you know, with the caveat that, you know, if you give people high doses of things like psilocybin or other psychedelics, you know, there are some risks um, that you need to take into account and in people with a, uh, you know, a history or family history of things like psychosis, where it's known that things like this can, you know, precipitate uh, or, or, you know, trigger those sorts of things, but right. it, even though it's rare. But so I, I think that that's, you know, the, the main, you know, the main story with these things. Right. Yeah, well, and, and there, you know, there were specific questions around PTSD. Obviously, there's been some work with both MDMA and I think ketamine um, around those. Um, uh, DARPA actually started a new program just focused on preclinical work around focused pharma, um, which is which is very interesting because the majority of uh, evacuations from the military uh, sort of field at this point are actually psychiatric in nature. Um, so there's absolutely a, a need both in the you know sort of regular general population as well as the the military population. I'm curious what you know what the what the collective panel thinks about around kind of the, the clinic model that's developing. So, so I know we've talked about the longer experiences requiring sort of therapeutic help and in, in, in integration, which seems, you know, part of the set and setting, right, of the original Roland Griffiths work and others work. But if we find different compounds and they have different mechanisms of action, is this something that a primary care physician could subscribe or is this going to always be in a specialty clinic or a retreat. What are what are your the panel's thoughts around around the mechanism of, of delivering these medicines? I think it depends on the drug. Yeah. So, so, so you know, for example, our ibogaine program fundamentally will be like likely used in a hot people in detoxes or hospitals or sure. that stuff, I'm guessing. So, that's for opioid. The ibogaine you're working on is for opioid addiction yeah, or addiction. Opioid, is that yeah, right? Sorry, yes, for 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 treating. If these are like sort of you know, um, very novel approaches to treat it, various kinds of addiction. But you know, we'll probably because it these are likely at least are the first generation are likely to be highly hallucinatory. Um, uh, that you know, if they're not something you're going to you know uh, pick up at your pharmacy. Right. Uh, uh, so, um, so I think that'll depend on on what those drugs are. I do think that the you know the business model that folks have of you know needing bricks and mortar you know places to deliver their treatments and being able to build out that business within you know a short period of time you know that that does sound rather challenging you know to, but you know there are these ketamine clinics and this sort of thing. I think there's just a lot. There's a lot going on, so it's just hard to know how any of that's going to play out, and uh, you know, in the long run. So you, you know, we want we want to sort of create things that are as easy to administer as, and inexpensively as possible, um, and that I think that that part about combining them with the right behavioral psychotherapy approaches is 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 always going to be something we need to kind of fight for. Look at Sprovato and Jane J. You know they have this terrible rollout. I think of that product, as far as I know, um, and and you know the FDA rep, you know just has people sitting in a clinic spritzing stuff in their nose. There's no mandate of any therapy of any kind. Period. So yeah, you know, yeah, that's not a good yeah. Out in Texas in the parking lot, you know, getting treated with your you know Sprovato and somebody's right. watching. You know, I, I just, that's, you know, kind of crazy to me, but I, yeah. so I think that's, that's uh, how that all gets rolled out is going to be important. And, you know, some of that could be done in various settings later where, you know, with, with, with the, you know, the benefit of things like virtual reality and other kinds of modalities that allow you to create environments um, at will. Absolutely. Yeah. No, that's really interesting that you bring that up because I think that's, and one of the things that we've seen in the time of, we call it the time of COVID, right? You know, telehealth, teletherapy, lots more therapeutic interventions happening, you know, in a, in a remote setting. And so, you know, again, some of these different compounds give us opportunities, I think, to, to, to look at how that care might be distributed in, in different ways. I'm, I'm a little bit curious. I, I want to make sure we have some time for questions as well. This is sort of a it's sort of a, uh, it's a dual sided question. And I hope, I hope that, you know, you, you don't mind, but like from, like from an industry perspective, what are you like most fearful of happening in this space? 
you know, so what is your, what is your worst fear? And then what are your predictions around what could make the industry sort of like blow open and really kind of revolutionize CNS, you know, pharmacology, neuropharmacology. So first give me your disaster scenario and then tell me the, the, the good things that are going to, the, the good thing that might happen. I'm good at thinking of disasters, so. Thank uh, you, Rob, thank you. I appreciate you jumping in on that. So, so you know, I, I would say if there are bad, really bad events, uh, suicide, self-harm, uh, violence that occur in the trials that are ongoing, that, that will cause regulators to really put a pause on the research. And, you know, we've seen things like that happen. It would be a kind of class phenomenon pretty rapidly, you know, especially if it was across two different agents, you know, two different studies. So that would be sort of the nightmare. I think all the studies that are out there are pretty careful, but, you know, the more you do, then people are less vigilant and then things can go off the rails. And, and we're dealing with patients who are inherently prone to bad things happening to them, suicide, for instance, uh, regardless of what their treatment is. So that, that could be so, you know, something that could affect it. And it, un it could be totally unrelated even to the agents, just bad luck. So that's, that's my uh, fear, so. Your fear, that's your fear. Anybody, no, I, anybody wanna share their fears? Anybody else wanna share their fears with me? No, <laughs> I, 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 think, I, think, um, I think that's, that's obviously the, 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 the clearest fear. And I, I would say, you know, again, that I think that there's such a kind of, a, a, a kind of rush of, of a kind of flood of companies springing up doing this that I suppose that the, the danger is that the competitive intensity pushes companies to be reckless mm. uh, with that now obviously the regulators are there to to, to make sure that right. people can't be reckless and put they put safety first but that's you know that there is you know that's what you know the so far and you know there's been a considerable amount of, of research done indeed LSD is, is the most studied substance in history, amazingly. Um, wow. But the, you know, there have been none of those episodes yet. So we should, we should take confidence that if people continue to be careful, you know, the clinical, clinical setting and, and the careful treatment protocols seem to be a, a very good protection against those types of risks. But, but I, I, I do agree that that's, that's the kind of, the thing that one fears. Right. Is there is there anything that that you guys collectively think will will like really open people's mind to the therapeutic potential in this space? Obviously it's being covered in the news and stuff, but you know, is there a is there a transformative event that might really yeah. you know give this a shot in the arm? Uh, um, I, I think it's when the data comes in. Mm. You know, that's that's gonna be convincing. Yeah. You know? yeah. I mean and maps I, I actually because I mean I, I would say arguably the data has come in with maps like their their phase three PTSD study is mm -hmm. is I mean like seriously good. I, so I, I mentioned Steve who I, Jonathan knows who, who's was head of global commercial strategy at Johnson and Johnson who oh. works works with us and and he you know he's we obviously we're old friends with Rick. And at maps and we were kind of giving some advice about commercialization of map uh, of, of, of the mdma and you know his point was well if the results are this good you know it, commercialization gets a lot easier kind of thing yeah, so you know I, sure. I think i think when you when, when that drug gets a license and actually starts being rolled out i think that will be a, a huge moment and that's you know that's kind of expected in 2023 Right. So, and, and maybe right. even sooner because the results in the first phase three were so strong. Right. You know, I love, I love the theme here, which is kind of where we started, which was like, why now? And then what could make this breakthrough? It's really about the science, right? It's really about, like we've talked about removing some of the taboos and really doing the proper clinical trials and the proper controlled testing to, to show how efficacious it can be. Um, I, I would also add that, um, you know, there's real appetite in the patient community, uh, you know, my colleagues who are running studies, you know, a depression study with uh, psilocybin, they have a wait list of 200 wow. potential patients. That's never happens with, you know, like the drugs that are now approved. I mean, it's- <laughs> Yeah, nobody's lining it's up. Phenomenal, this. yeah. <laughs> 
That's a, that's so, a great, that's a great sign, Rob. I, I appreciate that, that comment. Okay. Well, I do want to open it up. Caleb has queued up um, some questions uh, from the, um, from the audience. So Caleb, maybe you want to start with that one on um, maybe some of the other compounds. Sure, sure. Th this is a, a quick question and it ties into some other ones. We are getting some questions in here thematically. Um, and for those that have other questions, please type them in. Um, this one is, is anyone working on ayahuasca from a pharmaceutical angle? So I, I, I can answer some of that actually. Um, so obviously, so I presume the person who's asked knows. So ayahuasca is obviously a kind of plant-based and it's actually a mix of, of the two main ingredients come from two different plants. Um, so it's a kind of brew. Uh, and and so from a pharmaceutical development perspective, and I, I have some experience in this because I, I, before this, had, had a, a drug development company that we sold that was focused on, on um, cannabis drug development so when you're working with a plant getting it to kind of pharmaceutical standardization is is is, is challenging um and and so uh you know it, it it poses significant kind of regulatory challenges to to work with plants not not insurmountable obviously G, gw pharma are an example of, of of success in in that area but um the the kind of uh, regulators like it when it's one single compound like psilocybin and you know that they're, they're they're kind of an easily understandable single purified synthetic compound it's a kind of simpler kind of proposal to, to a regulator uh, but in, in terms of work so maps who are who are a kind of a, another non-profit have been working in this space for for as long as the Beckley Foundation they they are doing research on ayahuasca as a social benefit corp on in a non-profit way and and looking to develop that and so fingers crossed they'll succeed because obviously there's amazing real world kind of anecdotal reports of of, of kind of really quite transformational of uh, therapeutic effects of ayahuasca right. That's thank, great. thank you thank you um there's some other questions here around lsd and maybe jonathan i could point these questions to you um one of them is, you know, there have been a lot of people that have been experimenting with these outside of a controlled clinical setting. Are there any downsides that, that you've observed to that? Um, and then an, another question here was around the advent of how LSD was brought to America. Maybe you could uh, give a little insight on that as well. Yeah, um, I mean, I. I don't, I don't re remember all the details about how LSD was brought to America. I mean, obviously, uh, Hoffman uh, and uh, uh, Hoffman and LaRoche, Hoffman and LaRoche, they, they developed the drug, they, you know, discovered the drug and they were used, they were giving it out. They didn't know what quite what to do with it. So, it, it, you know, because it's sort of like it's creating this psychedelic experience, but, you know, especially back then it was like, well, what exactly so they were basically doing like a essentially an un, large uncontrolled experiment by sending it to like any therapist who would who wanted to try it and and only asking for you know them to report back on what they observed so it was uh so so uh so it was sort of not so that that was the sort of you know before and then of course they had to uh you know st stop manufacturing and then pull that back when the you know the government, you know, went uh, went after all of these uh, uh, these these drugs and made them illegal. So, um, but that created a large amount of information in a kind of non-standardized way. And, and and I guess that you know, in terms of people experimenting with these things, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of people using LSD or psilocybin right now, either as a microdose um, kind of uh, way for usually for things like anxiety or cogn cognition or uh, creativity, these sorts of things. Um, and I think that, you know, that, uh, you know, I think with large doses of these things, you know, maybe uh, it's a little, uh, to me, it's a little bit like scuba diving alone, you know, uh, you know, you, you can kind of do it if you're good at really good. It's, I've done it, but it's sort of like, you know, I know I'm not really supposed to do that. You know? that's, a, that's a great analogy, Jonathan. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, so, you know, it's interesting. Another question came up around, you know, could a patient's previous experience with, with psychedelics or recreational psychedelic use, do you see that as harmful or helpful or additive in the context of if they then went on to use it in terms of a clinical setting? Do we have any data there? So, so we, we, we don't have data. Well, what we do have and what I, I've actually, so we are actually, that's a subject that we're looking at very carefully right now because we're, we're designing, we've just designed a, a phase one healthy volunteer study for 5-MeO-DMT. And so the, one of the things that the regulators asked was we want to see naive psychedelic naive patients in the patient population as well we can't we don't want you to just do a study on patients who have taken psychedelics loads of times before we want to see this is safe and tolerable to to patients who haven't taken this drug before in terms of but you know so we we've been kind of discussing it with num a number of the kols who've, who've done most of the research up to now and there is no correlation between you know dosage and prior use or anything like that there seems to be the same correlation in terms of the likelihood for you to have uh you know a, a, a strong psychedelic experience whether or not you've um taken it before and and there doesn't seem to be a correlation between no, I, I haven't heard of any correlation between positive or negative outcomes being any different between experienced or naive. But, but, but I think Cosmo, the, the, the issue I imagine is that like with most psychiatric illnesses, it's like, you know, a third of the people get better, a third of them not so much, yeah. a third of them might just get side effects, you know? Yeah. And so, um, and since, and so when you look at these populate, if you saw, if you, if all the people coming into the trial are the people that like know that, they, you know, psych they do good with psychedelics. Yeah, that won't be generalizable, which is the totally agree. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Totally. Well, let me. Yeah, let me. Um, that that was a great, great response and helpful that you that you have some some sort of you know thoughts around that. Maybe let's just answer uh, end on sort of a forward facing. Um, you know, kind of industry question, right? And and there are a couple threads here, you know, we pulled on the IP thread and, and other things like, you know, will this be adopted by mainstream pharmaceutical companies? Do you see there being a new breed of like new pharma? Like, you know, there's so many challenges with the existing drugs and the drug industry and, you know, so can they exceed, you know, sort of, sort of without a transformative new drug? Like what, you know, just kind of give, give us the industry perspective on, you know, what might happen here. I'll, I'll take a first crack having uh, spent a lot of time in big pharma. Um, a couple of things. So, you know, what I think there's a lesson from J and J's bravado that, you know, and, and that will bear out over time as well. You know, what is the profit they can reap from that? Because, that, that is the kind of labor intensive uh, treatment. Uh, but I do think that big pharma will follow where the returns will be. And we do know that several of the top 10 diseases that offer public health burden in the, in the developed world are CNS diseases, addiction, depression, uh, you know, rival uh, heart disease. So, you know, there is a will to do that. So I, I would expect that they would come into that space, um, you know, once they see that, you know, it, it's more than just a proof of concept trial here and there, but there's real, they could see how it would get traction in the marketplace, you know, so. Yeah, and, and, and then you have to get people to pay for it, um, you know, so, um, and, and I think, you know, one instructive, maybe just example is, you know, when the statins came on the market, you know, Merck, developed the first statin. This was re quite revolutionary uh, for heart disease, right? Uh, and um, nobody wanted to pay for it. Um, there weren't any other good treatments. They wouldn't pay for it. And, um, and it wasn't until then um, Merck did a real world, this is after approval, uh, they did a real world trizer, trial at uh, Kaiser Permanente. And it was, the doctors could do anything they wanted. All the only requirement is start with, you know, either standard care, which was like niacin and cholestyramine and these awful things or a statin, but then they do whatever you want. And, um, and at the end it was like, 
the statin was so much better and so much preferable for patients and adherence was so much better, like that was it. So, you know, the, the insurance companies had nowhere to go. So I think that it's just, you know, it's going to be data driven and it's going to be showing that these things make a big difference for people faster and better, you know, um, so suicide, uh, suicidal ideation is not coming to your emergency room all the time. Um, you know, these are very expensive things to manage. So, so I think it's, you know, that, that's, I, I think that pharma will follow, uh, you know, as that goes along and, 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 um, and the real profits won't likely be made as much from the first generation, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, Lipitor, Pfizer made much more money probably than Merck ever made from, you know, revolutionizing the field. So, right. so I think that's, that's what I think about it. Yeah. I, I, I'd only add one thing, which I, I, I so I, I, I mean, I completely agree. Um, but I, I think the other point is, you know, big pharma is made up of people. And, and if you look at Rob, comes from Big Pharma. Jonathan's worked at Big Pharma. Just in my company alone, we have the former CEO of Otsuka Europe, the former head of global commercial strategy at, and market access at Johnson & Johnson, the former head of global medical affairs at Johnson & Johnson. These are big, the people at the top of Big Pharma. So like it only needs one of those people who's in Big Pharma right. to make that same decision that these are things that are really worth investing in. You, so I, I, I think it is only a matter of time as long as the, and a matter of good data. Right. Thank you. That was, you know, I think hopefully that was a, a good place to end. I'm, I'm mindful of, of everyone's time. I want to thank our panelists today. You were all brilliant. And I know that you, you added a lot of knowledge to, to the folks, you know, who called in. Thanks to our LPs, the larger Prime Movers Lab family, the people we've roped in from various, you know, LinkedIn and, and blogs and, and other things. We're, we're grateful for your, your thoughts and, and time here. Um, later in this year, I'll be working on a research briefing in this area as well. So a bit of a longer form than just a blog to, to cover that. And of course, our LPs can always contact us directly if they have any, any questions about what we've talked about today. Again, thank you so much to our panelists. Such a pleasure. So glad that you and, and your teams are working on this super important issue. And we wish you the best of luck as you transform mental health for all of us. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Amy. All right. All right, cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys. Bye, guys.